Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another VES Artex Academy webinar. Today, we're talking with Daniel Scothern about five ways to simplify and declutter your dairy cow diet. Now, Daniel's from Dairy Nutrition. He's a dairy nutrition coach from Scothorn Nutrition, and he's joining us from Nova Scotia, Canada. We're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You can ask those through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen or through the question and answer section. We'd like to say thank you very much for joining us and Daniel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so as, uh, as it was said, I'm from Nova Scotia. Actually, we are in a lockdown as we speak. Uh, so there's nothing uh, that I would rather be doing more today on a, on a sunny, uh, blue sky Friday afternoon than uh, to be speaking to dairy farmers from uh, from all around the world. Actually, uh, we took a chance to uh, look at the attendee list of uh, people that at least signed up, anyways. And uh, uh, everybody, I think, from any major dairy country is going to be joining us today. Um, anywhere from Canada, U.S. to uh, Australia, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, the EU, uh, UK, there's many countries represented. So uh, unfortunately, guys, I can only speak uh, in uh, English to you today. Um, I don't think uh, you want me to be practicing my, uh, my Dutch or my uh, Spanish. Uh, but uh, so thank you for your patience. And I will try to talk with a, a very low key Nova Scotia accent today. So um, I'll advance to the first slide here. And uh, as it was said, uh, said, or as it was written on the uh, invite, many of you know that today's topic is called five ways to declutter your, your dairy ration, uh, brackets and save money. So I think that last, those last three words and save money are really high on uh, every dairy farmers and dairy nutritionists and, and bankers um, agenda in uh, 2021. And it's been uh, a topic that myself as a dairy nutritionist and, and coach uh, have, has, have been feeling daily from, from uh, clientele. Um, we work in the uh, nutrition services end of uh, the dairy industry. We provide uh, independent nutrition advice uh, to dairy farmers on the East Coast of Canada mainly. Uh, we do some work overseas. Uh, so this talk, um, it's going to be you know, it's, it's only a 40 minute talk. So it's going to focus more on what we're used to seeing in uh, Canada and parts of the U S as far as ingredients uh, being used, but I will try to talk in respect to a, a nutrient basis for many things, uh, just so that many people in other countries uh, today can relate. So you may want to uh, take note that uh, my email is on the bottom there. Uh, feel free to reach out. And again, uh, thanks to the host, uh, VES and Artec, for having me uh, invited on to uh, speak to their clients today. I really appreciate the invite. So um, I should also say that this, the, uh, the topic that we're discussing today actually was uh, written as a, uh, as a, uh, a story in Progressive Dairy in uh, 2019. Uh, 2019, uh, we, we actually thought that we were experiencing high feed prices, but fast forward to 2021, and it's quite a bit different. I think things are 30, 40, 50% higher in price. And uh, it's a new, it's, it's certainly, hopefully not a new reality, hopefully temporary, but, um, uh, and I'm gonna, one little bragging point here, uh, this, this story uh, that was published in Progressive Dairyman was the second most read article uh, in 2019. So uh, thanks, mom. I appreciate you going on daily to, um, to, to read that story over and over again. So what do we think of when I say the word clutter? Feel free to use that, uh, I think, Q&A window. I, I don't see, actually, there's a chat window too. Feel free to uh, just uh, put um, comments into the chat window. I think it's nice to just uh, see what uh, people are thinking as we go through this. Uh, some of you are joining from Facebook and I realize I won't be able to see your comments, but the question is, what do you think of when I say clutter? I think in many parts of our lives in family and just our outside of business, outside of dairy farming, we think of uh, examples like this, uh, 
I know the first thing that uh, I think of is my office. Um, you know, I, all you guys can see is there's a four foot swath of my office. You don't see what's over there. And it's not, I'm not saying it looks uh, exactly like Al Gore's office there in the top right of the screen, uh, but that's uh, often when I think of clutter, I think of my office. And number two, I think of my garage. Um, those are uh, now Heather, my, my partner, she may think of different things when uh, I say the word clutter, but we often don't think about this in, in relation to uh, dairy farming or dairy diets. Um, I've been a nutritionist now for uh, around 22 years. Um, I started out in the, uh, in the animal feed uh, business. I worked for different feed companies in, uh, in Canada and I uh, was exposed to clutter um, from the first day I joined uh, the feed industry and in the number of formulas um, and the number of ingredients and many other things. Uh, and we're talking about that today, reducing clutter and how that reduction of clutter can actually save money. So I'm just gonna take a peek at the chat window there. Um, thank you. Yeah, clutter, a mess. Um, <laughs> one person says time to organize. So what is clutter in dairy diets? Um, well, it could come in many forms. Uh, could be multiple protein sources, multiple starch sources. Uh, could be overfeeding of minerals and vitamins. I think we're exposed now to uh, some, a, a lot of messaging from, uh, from uh, mentors such as uh, Dr. Bill Weiss, who, uh, who explains the importance of not overfeeding minerals, vitamins, especially on this new update of the Dairy NRC. So we're gonna hear a lot more about that over the next year when that's released. Uh, also redundant feeds and antagonizing ingredients. So those are often things that I run into when I look at dairy diets as uh, what I call clutter, all right? Now, why would we want to clutter our dairy diets? I mean, that's, that, that's ridiculous, Daniel. Why, why, why would this ever come about? Why would you even suggest this is an issue? I think it's, again, like our garage picture. I mean, you know what it's like when you go and uh, you finish up something in the yard and just sort of put it, put it in the corner there. Maybe it's uh, October and you have to put the lawn chairs in, but you know what? The shelf that you used to have them on, it's not there. So things just get cluttered like they do in a garage. Um, a lot of times in dairy, we often bring in extra ingredients as a way to sort of spread the risk. Um, okay, for example, uh, say our supplier of corn grain is not able to uh, deliver on time on a frequent basis, or perhaps uh, the, the uh, quality of that corn grain may be a little bit off from load to load. Uh, so what do we do? Naturally, we go and we either change suppliers to a more uh, uh, supportive one, or we bring in a second source of starch or uh, grain, for example, wheat, fine ground wheat, or even a second source of corn, say steamrolled corn, for example, or flake corn. Um, but then what happens at the end of the day is we have an extra ingredient. We're not dealing with the core of the problem, which is that initially that's a bad supply of corn. Um, I, I love veterinarians. Okay. And, and, uh, some, a couple of my, my good friends are vets, veterinarians and, uh, by, you know, and I'm sure there's a cut, there's definitely some on the, uh, presentation today listening. So total respect, but you know, often, uh, if I'm speaking to vet veterinarians, um, they may be uh, asking for a certain feed additive to be added because of a certain reason why um, the hoof trimmer, for example, could ask for biotin or say an organic zinc form or something like that, um, or extra iodine in the old days. Um, now, a lot of uh, things get added to the diets uh, because there might be multiple, what we call multiple chefs in the kitchen. Um, there may be a nutritionist that works for the feed company. There may also be on that same farm, a consulting advisor that comes in, say, once or twice a year to give some oversight or provide a second opinion, I should say. And uh, also uh, some, in a lot of cases, veterinarians are also uh, acting as nutritionists. So there's multiple chefs in the kitchen in many farms. And um, at the end of the day, um, uh, we, we have a ration that sometimes looks like a committee put it together rather than a single nutritionist, right? So here's another example of, uh, of what I wanna to talk to about today. It's perfectionism. Um, in our society, 
uh, I think that you would probably agree that perfectionism has become something that we struggle with more and more every year. I think, uh, you know, it's, I think it's pretty clear that um, in pop culture, like uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, um, the way a person looks uh, or acts um, often has to be uh, uh, presented in a, in a, in quite a perfect uh, method or, or way or video or, or in terms of perfection. Uh, so it's possibly something that's we, that are that us as uh, as adults as well are ex, are exposed to this this quest for perfection, and you know no better there's there's not a better example than this uh, men's health cover. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's easy right forty minutes of uh, muscle forty minutes of working out a day will get will make you look like that but you know what um, I think it takes a lot more than forty minutes. Uh, and the other thing is that, that the cost of this guy here, this gentleman, uh, to get that uh, eight pack of abdominal muscles uh, is, is very, very expensive. That cost of that, that takes a lot of extra time. The same thing with trying to perfect our dairy diets. Uh, to get that last liter of milk or make that diet a little bit better uh, by formulating for this and this and this and this and trying to meet all the requirements to that cow comes at a very expensive cost. And uh, what we call that is, as many of you know, the law of diminishing returns. Um, the, the other thing clear about this uh, photograph here, this gentleman is that um, he's probably had to give up uh, ice cream, uh, beer, pizza. And uh, my, um, I think um, I can definitely guarantee to my wife that uh, I definitely won't look like this guy someday because those are three foods that definitely not willing to give up. So now, perfectionism is one that's in many um, applications in life, right? <laughs> it's, you know, the bridge that crosses uh, the harbor or the river. Uh, we want that to be perfectly designed. Uh, we don't want any errors in there. We know what happens when bridges fall, right? Um, we also want to see um, uh, brain surgeons uh, being pretty well perfect, uh, air traffic controllers. And uh, you can see these beautiful fans on the top right side. Uh, we want that little controller box in the top right corner of that fan box uh, to be pretty well perfect, right? We don't want that to give out on a day that's got a, uh, a THI of, uh, say, uh, 85 or 90 or whatever, and uh, the temperature outside is 35 Celsius and the humidity is 90%. The last thing we want is that for that controller to give out, right? So, and this is a, uh, a slide that that's sort of wraps up uh, this this. Uh, discussion in general of perfectionism and, uh, and clutter. And it's, uh, you can all read, but I'll read it in case you're, uh, you're on a, a, a smartphone, you can't see it. Uh, this guy, this masculine guy has a shirt that says perfect and a little more average uh, built guy says, I just did 20 sit-ups. It's time to grab a beer and he's done. So I think this is sort of the way we should look at dairy diets in some respects when things are really expensive, when uh, on a year like 2021. No. Uh, if you guys can uh, put your fingers on your smartphone or your keyboard again, and perhaps um, give me an idea of what you think of on your farm or for your clientele, uh, what you have control over um, on your dairy. What is it? What are the main things that you have control over that has an impact on production? Uh, or profitability uh, when it comes to your cows, how you feed your cows. If you can just simply write in, uh, type in a couple of things on the chat window so we can get some feedback uh, from people listening today. What do you think of when there's things you can control? All right, thank you. There's a few answers coming in there. Um, this is an awesome picture. Um, it's more or less a, the rule of the 80-20 where you focus 80 percent of sorry if you 80-20 rule being focusing the majority of your time on the 80 percent um, is what's going to yield the best results I think I twisted that a little bit but I think everybody knows what the 80-20 rule is um, now when we got this collision of things that matter and things that you can control you can see it's only taken up 10 percent of that surface area there uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback here. Thank you. Um, so 
Danielle says, uh, how the TMR is mixed and delivered. Um, Tad says, management, management, management. Can't agree more. Uh, Karen says, nutrient content of the dairy ration. Uh, it goes on, utter preparation for milk and feeds, medication, being consistent with every chore, no matter how mundane it is. Yeah, totally, totally agree with all those things. There's a lot of things we can control, but one of the things we have a hard time controlling um, that we've experienced obviously this year is what our cost of uh, ingredients and grains and feeds are going to be. Anything that we buy, we've had very little control over. I think many people last fall in that quarter four of 2020 thought that things are a little bit too expensive to book ahead. Uh, that's where we see where we experienced a lot of our clientele uh, struggling is why would I book right now? Things are at an all time high uh, or very close to an all time high in the fourth quarter of 2020 when they typically book. Uh, so everybody was exposed for the winter and into the spring and still continue to be exposed to some extent because prices just kept creeping higher and higher. So what we do have control over is things we're going to uh, review today. And that is how we can adjust the diet, how we can reduce clutter. So enough of the introduction, right? Let's uh, move on. Uh, one of the uh, nice things about having a practical uh, presentation like this today is that I can talk uh, farm language. I can, uh, and the subject of our, uh, uh, the case study of our presentation today is uh, going to feature Leblanc dairy in New Brunswick. And uh, for anybody that's ever been to New Brunswick, you can see it's got a lot of coastal area, but this farm that we're going to uh, cover today and with some of our examples is in this uh, area here close to Moncton, where you can see my mouse sliding around on the screen. So they're right off the Bay of Fundy. Uh, you can see that blue dot. That's actually where I'm sitting right now. My house isn't that big. It's not the size of that blue dot. Um, it's a, but we look right over the Bay of Fundy. Um, we can't uh, see uh, much other than ocean uh, mud flats and uh, a couple of lobster boats out there. So you know what I'm looking forward to this weekend, right? Uh, so this farm here is a one has a one group TMR. Uh, it, it would be what we call a like um, a, a relative, actually, in fact, a, a high production farm uh, in this region. Uh, they always hover between 40 and 43 liters, and they do that with a one group TMR. Um, days of milk, a little high, I would say 175. You know, we probably want to have 160 to 170 uh, to, to aim for, but 175 is certainly excellent. Uh, 4.3 milk fat, and that usually hovers between 4.1 and 4.5, depending on season. And uh, a decent feed efficiency ratio, which we'll get into a uh, Actually, one person had a question about that that we'll address later. Feed efficiency ratio of 1.75 is what I would consider to be uh, ideal, not too low, not too high. So let's go through a few photographs of this farm. And you can see it's a, uh, it's a three row stall barn. This is a 20 year old facility, maybe, maybe even 25 years old at this point. Um, not a hot area because they're close to the Bay of Fundy. So they seem to be able to get uh, pretty good air movement with these uh, slow speed overhead fans. Uh, they just actually improved the ventilation uh, two weeks ago by putting in more box fans on the uh, outer uh, stalls. And uh, I know there's a lot of ventilation experts on here. So you, you might be kind of cringing when you look at this setup, but you know what, the uh, production is pretty good and it could be better, right? Um, but uh, this is a obviously a 20, 25 year old technology of stall. So, but does a job. In this case here, we're still getting good production. Uh, there's certainly far better stalls out there now. I think one of the keys in this farm is that it's well bedded. They're fortunate to have a, a hardwood furniture company uh, close by where they get a lot of this nice, dry, fine hardwood, uh, dried, pre-dried sawdust, which makes cow comfort excellent. Um, as far as feed bunk management goes, you can see that it's quite, quite stellar. It's uh, you know, they, they go tire to tire, really good slope of packing. Uh, they're using walls. These bunks go way over to the left side too. And you can actually see a roof on some of those feed bunks. Uh, they have room for uh, ample storage of silage. And we use uh, sandbags, sorry, pea gravel bags, uh, two layers of, of, uh, of plastic along the side. You can see the clear plastic and the black plastic. So a lot of things right here. But uh, take note of the feed. Uh, 
the feed bin setup. There's not a lot of bins, right? I mean, it's four bins, and this is pretty well enough bins to, uh, to feed most of the farm. There is a couple of ingredients off to the side, for example, dry fats, and um, uh, one or two of the supplements for, uh, for uh, close-up dry cows and uh, heifers. Uh, but primarily all the commodities that we feed to this herd are, are located, stored in these four bins. And we're getting into that through the presentation. This is a, uh, the wet brewer's grain uh, storage, one of the, what I would call high standards of wet brewer's grain storage, uh, four little uh, mini bunkers. Uh, each one holds a, a 22 ton load that's delivered at times, a couple times a week, uh, times like this uh, when, um, when beer consumption is picking up actually in Atlantic Canada, there'd be more available. So, and um, there's, uh, there's an, his, this is actually the current diet of LeBlanc dairy farm. On the left side, you can see these are all individual ingredients that are added to the TMR. Um, this farm chose not to do a premix of, uh, of these dry commodities here. Uh, they decided to do a um, just individually add each one of these ingredients seem to be the fastest way for them to do it. They have a mixture that's big enough to do two mixes a day for the lactating cows. So it's primarily corn silage, haylage, uh, wet brewer's grain, soybean hulls. Uh, normally we don't have soybean hulls, but we are experiencing a significant drought from 2020 and then New Brunswick. And uh, uh, take note, there's a single source of protein there other than wet brew and what the haylage provides. And that is namely uh, expeller uh, uh, canola meal, which is 41% uh, protein. Uh, fine ground corn, uh, Enervive 95, which is a palmitic acid, uh, sodium bicarb, premix and water, okay. And you can see over there, the diet's uh, fairly uh, straightforward. The uh, dry matter intake's excellent. It's 30 kgs and the, uh, there's enough uh, metabolizable energy in this diet for 45 kgs of milk. There's enough MP in there for about 41 kgs. And it turns out they actually are milking about 41 uh, liters today. So a little bit better than 41 kgs. So the... They seem to be milking to what the MP allows in this case, which is commonly what I see on many other farms as well. Even if we over formulate for energy, we still seem to get a, uh, the cows milking to what the MP allows. So um, the crude protein is uh, it's actually stuck in there flat at 16%. And uh, you can see many of the details below. So um, I'm just going to pull up a video here of that farm. Uh, before we proceed to the next uh, slide. So, so if somebody can be kind enough to tell me in the chat window, as soon as they see the video plan, just so I can trust that, uh, that we are actually um, seeing the same thing. So this is a herd that excels in, in dry matter intake uh, for the following reasons. Okay. Okay, thank you. Continue the video. Okay, take a look at the feed bunk. All right, what stands out here to me as a dairy coach is the amount of feed availability. Okay, you can see on both sides, a high, high amount of feed availability. And uh, for a herd of like moderate sized Holsteins, I think it takes actually pretty good. It's like in the mid 20s, 25 to 26 kgs. All right, the herd is producing quite good, 1.6 kgs of butter fat. And you can see feed access is really one of the things that makes a huge difference. Okay, these cows are not up here rushing for the feed bunk, which is a good sign. They're just ease, they're just gradually consuming their diet. They're not sorting. Very good eating behavior. And this is one thing that I look for a lot on herds that excel. It seems to be a common pattern. Now the reason why they achieve such a good dry matter intake is partly because they, they give them copious amounts of feed, but also because of the uh, frequency of feed push-ups. You can see this little machine coming down the middle here. That's essentially just a reverse alley scraper. This is nothing new. This facility is probably 20 years old now, but the, um, the result is just consistent dry matter intake, uh, high milk production, and very healthy cows. Thank you, have a great day. Okay. Uh, so just hold on one second. I just got to pull up the, uh, 
the, uh, the slideshow here. Okay. There we go. Okay. So if anybody can just uh, say in the chat window that you can actually see the slideshow again, that would be excellent. Um, one person asked, okay, thank you, Klaus. Did you find better dry matter intake in the summer months? And uh, um, as a matter of fact, uh, right now we don't have any heat stress. So I certainly wouldn't consider the summer heat stress. So, but we do tend to in, in on the East coast of Canada. Uh, and I think this is a case for many parts of Canada when we get our cooler weather from uh, uh, say September, October on to, uh, to this point, uh, late May, uh, then dry matter intake is often excelling at this time. And that's probably because we have some, some of our best fermented feeds. Uh, we still have relatively cool, dry air um, that comes into May in many parts of Canada. So um, one of the first ways that we can uh, look at ration clutter is like I said, protein ingredients. Um, now, this is a slide that I fully realize uh, will cause uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, thoughts being provoked. Um, it's not necessarily um, the first thing that we rush out to do as nutritionists is remove uh, protein ingredients. Um, we, many of us are used to ration formulating with models like the CNCPS or uh, other versions that are available in, in Europe. And myself, I use AMTS. So I'm well aware of the benefits of formulating for metabolizable protein and some of the individual amino acids like methionine and lysine. Okay. But that said, uh, we have to recognize that in a year like this, when everything costs a lot of money, um, it's, uh, there's two ways to look at this challenge that we have. It's to, um, to rely on a couple of sources of protein, maybe one or two, um, that's going to give our, that's going to make our diet about 90% perfect, right? Maybe 95% perfect. Maybe we can't quite get the amino acids where they need without supplemental amino acids. Maybe we can't quite get the MP to where we need as in the, uh, the example here with LeBlanc dairy, they're, uh, they're challenged with uh, the MP allowable milk of 40.56. That's, and that's limiting their milk production. But the cost of bringing in that second ingredient when soybean meal is 700 Canadian are currently for a spot load um, in this region is, uh, is questionable. Um, now, the other way to look at it too is, well, can we just go with one or two sources of protein and uh, formulate for amino acids by, by supplement uh, lysine, methionine and the supplements or premixes? And that's a choice that I favor on many dairies where, where they've surpassed, um, say, the 40 kg mark or 40 liter per cow mark, 45 liters, uh, where I can see their cows will really benefit from that extra little boost in, uh, in, in protein quality. So I think that's a good place to, 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 to stand is uh, depends on the farm and availability. But many, many times uh, in my travels uh, through the past decade, I've seen Diets, and this is in many countries, this is not just a, uh, a Canada uh, issue where there could be perhaps 10 different protein ingredients. I fully understand that there may be a price advantage to having that many, uh, but I, I do have a hard time um, uh, understanding uh, why we may need that many um, and how price can be that much of an advantage. I think there always should be uh, uh, some res um, relative control over the number of ingredients we use um, to get a diet that's a lot simpler for the feeders to mix and also uh, uh, less uh, inventory and procurement uh, for the manager. So, so when do you use a second or third source? Well, when formulating for MP or MA or uh, amino acids. In the case of uh, Eastern Canada, many times it makes sense to uh, feed canola as our primary protein ingredient, sometimes soy meal, depending on price. Uh, and then supplement the amino acids or maybe one uh, additional MP source such as amino plus or uh, soy pass or something like that. And there's many forms of bypass soy available around the world, I realize. So it just depends on what you guys, what uh, you guys and girls can get where you're at. Um, the other advantage of having a second or third source of protein when it provides some other key attributes uh, like palatability. Uh, in many cases in uh, this part of Canada, we feed wet brewers grain and you know, if it weren't for its palatability, um, I don't think we'd be feeding it uh, for simply for its uh, protein quality. It's not known to be high in a methionine or lysine has, I think, a little bit of histidine, if, if you believe that that may help. Um, it's 
Maybe uh, the other attribute that a protein ingredient would provide would be NDF. And again, um, that would be perhaps uh, something, a reason to consider distiller grains on a year like this or um, wet brewer's grain, or it, is, or it can be another source of energy, for example, corn gluten feed or corn distiller grains. So I think that's a time to look for a second or third source. Uh, many of our diets, and I'm not sure if uh, many of these are on, our, on a, the uh, talk I did for uh, AMTS last year uh, on canola meal, but um, as many of you know, I, I do many of the, we do many of the diets here on the East Coast with canola as the primary uh, protein in those diets. And then if we want an extra source of protein, we usually bring in a bypass soy or some amino acids. So um, this is something that's not new to many of you. Uh, any of you people on the call, uh, you're probably more aware than I am of the nutrient specifications of all different protein sources, but generally in this part of the world, these would be the four that we uh, seem to uh, feed a lot of. And uh, the amino plus can be interchanged with other bypass soy products. This is just one I, I was seen to be working with a lot lately. Um, now, canola meal is uh, sort of kind of what we are recognizing now is sort of the king of proteins, I suppose, if you are going to have a single source. Uh, it sits right beside soybean meal for probably milk potential. It's arguably a little more milk in canola meal than, than soy meal. I think the, a lot of the meta-analysis will, will show that there's probably a kg or two pounds more milk and cows that are fed canola meal on the uh, Bennett, on some of the recent meta analysis. And, um, but we can certainly get high levels of production uh, with using canola meal as the primary protein source. And I think the same can be said as soybean meal to a certain extent. Um, now, probably one of the things about canola meal that we, uh, that we often forget about is that it, al it also is providing uh, a lot of methionine, uh, well, sure many nutritionists think about that all the time uh, but as a, as a dairy producer I'm not sure if my brother for example being a dairy farmer thinks about the methionine contribution of canola uh, but it's certainly one of the highest as a percentage of the protein sources so that's probably partly what the, uh, the additional response is with canola. The other thing too is if we have to feed canola as a prim primary source versus soy meal we usually have to feed 20 to 25 percent more as the same amount of protein. Uh, so the price per ton really matters, obviously. But the other, the other thing that we're doing when we add canola meal to a diet is we're, in order to make space for that extra protein, we clearly have to reduce something else in that diet that typically comes by reducing forage. And what happens when we reduce forage, assuming that we have good rumen health and ad adequate amounts of NDF, when we reduce forage, we usually get an intake response and a milk response because the cow's first limiting uh, reason for, uh, for, for lack of intake would be because of the, uh, of, uh, for the forage NDF, uh, being, being high. So, um, it's going to advance so we can cruise through some of these slides and get into the, uh, Q and a, uh, the other, the second thing is starch ingredients. Now starch and NFC, I think are interchangeable, um, in today's talk, because I realized that I'm talking to a lot of people in, uh, Western regions of the U S or Canada, where, uh, sugary, high soluble fiber ingredients may be the king of uh, energy in your diets. Uh, a lot of my friends use uh, whey, and that provides uh, sometimes five to ten percent sugar in a diet, in addition to what's coming from forages and grains. So let's talk NFC here, and let's talk starch. Uh, we I think we're all sort of carry the same principle that we want to aim for around forty percent NFC. It's usually the cheapest way to get energy into a cow's diet. Um, that can come from various sources. Uh, it can be NFC can be coming from alfalfa silage, alfalfa hay, soy hulls, um, you know, all the grains, a uh, couple of the protein ingredients also have vitamin FC. And that typically results in a diet that's going to be in that 20 to 28% starch on uh, us starch lovers here on the East Coast. Uh, I should say on the, not necessarily just in the East Coast, but in the East in general. Um, where starch seems to be the cheapest and most available sort, form of energy. I think uh, we can push that starch to 28, maybe 30% on a, on a good day with really good feed bunk management. But classically, we try to run 25 to 27% on our diets here just to maintain room and health and good manure. So I think focusing on one good source of starch is what we need to uh, focus on, is what's important. Um, and that's 
in a lot of cases because we are getting ample amounts of NFC and starch from say corn silage. So by bringing in one additional source of starch, say dry corn or flake corn or uh, ground barley, uh, that's a second source of excellent starch, assuming that starch is well processed. And in my, also in, in my, I should say, not just opinion, but what I've seen from, from farms and uh, in, in the industry is that it's probably more important to have to focus on the processing of your uh, starch source, uh, say your corn, for example, it's, it's more important to focus on the processing of that than to go and buy a second source of uh, starch in order to boost uh, diet digestibility. So keeping it simple, I think stands has a, is very powerful when it comes to protein ingredients and starch ingredients. Um, now, Many of these feed sugar or sugary ingredients, and that could come in the way of uh, citrus pulp as well as, uh, as molasses or uh, sugar sources. But um, again, uh, sugar and starch are fairly interchangeable when we're trying to, uh, when, we're, when we're aiming for a certain limit, I suppose, in a diet. Um, and then when, when, as many of you know, when we feed uh, sugar, um, there's often a, uh, uh, a good chance that milk components will improve. Uh, we, we know that uh, sugar can increase the uh, digestibility of NDF in a diet and that uh, it seems to have a uh, slight positive uh, uh, impact on milk fat and uh, milk protein. So, yeah. um, This is a chart that many people are... Uh, can take and put in their own numbers for and when it comes to cost per ton, you may be able to put in more rows on this table. Uh, to keep it simple for this conversation this afternoon, um, I used some typical Canadian values on the East Coast here of what uh, grain sources would cost. Uh, these are Canadian dollars. Uh, if you uh, multiply it by uh, 0.83, uh, you'll get US dollars. So corn, I think, would be the equivalent of 320 US here. Now, when we do some simple, simple uh, mathematics on this, where we uh, take the water out of this and the, uh, the other things that aren't starchy in corn. So we take that $400 per ton and divide it by 0.85 and divide that by 0.74, then we get 640. This is an excellent way, a very simple way uh, for farms or uh, anybody really to to compare, do a quick, quick comparison of what that starch value is in their commodities that they're getting. Um, in today's uh, world uh, uh, on the East Coast, we seem to find uh, that corn grain still actually is, is probably a good bet unless we can get our hands on some high moisture corn uh, that, that a neighbor's selling or some, uh, some good priced wheat, say 350. So we usually find barley and wheat are the same price on the East Coast. So in this example here, um, if I was looking for a, uh, a, a primary starch on a high corn silage diet, um, I would highly consider wheat in this case, just because of its uh, cost per uh, metric ton dry matter of starch. Um, and that's if I couldn't get my hands on high moisture corn. Uh, another common ingredient that we see from time to time all over Canada and, and uh, the US is uh, bakery waste. Unfortunately, there's not enough bakery waste to go around to all the dairy farms because I think this is stuff that's usually priced at about 50 to 60 percent of dry corn value. Uh, so even when you shake out the uh, the water and, and you take into account, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the a bit of uh, shrink and spoilage and whatnot, uh, bakery waste and things like that are still excellent examples. Now, on a high corn silage diet, you could probably do fine with feed and bakery waste because it's not going to take much more starch to meet her requirements. But if, if you got to feed bakery waste at, say, uh, 20 pounds or, or 9 kgs of cow day to meet her starch requirement, then I'd, I'd be a little bit resistant because it's primarily wheat-based. Um, so the point of this, um, this section here on, on starch is to say, focus on one good form of starch, make sure it's well-processed, and take a look at this video here, which shows a corn grain that it's not really processed enough, right? I got a, there's a fairly simple test. Um, uh, actually, it's very scientific. Uh, it all relies on grip strength and uh, the amount of time you hold that, that uh, grip. I'm, I'm just kidding you, it's uh, very simple. It's simply just squeezing that, taking a handful of uh, ground corn, squeezing it, now, this is not ground fine enough, okay? 
the easy way to tell is that that corn is not holding in a ball. It's just an easy on-farm test that I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, I don't carry sieves with me. It's, um, it's often uh, something I can do quickly though, is just take a handful of that corn, see what it's processed like. Uh, the best way to assess uh, fecal starch uh, or starch uh, digestibility though, and corn digestibility is to look at fecal starch evaluation. Um, if you go back and look in, on some of my LinkedIn posts, you're going to see uh, there's, a, there's a, a post I put up, gosh, probably almost a year ago now on fecal starch and uh, had a lot of really good feedback from, uh, from LinkedIn on, uh, from different professionals all over the world, actually. Um, there was some excellent feedback, so I encourage you to go back on, if, uh, if you have access to LinkedIn, just uh, go back in some of my posts and look at that. But generally, um, when we look at manure, as we walk through a pen of cattle, uh, we want to start looking for spots like this. Um, this is a great eyeball approach to looking at, at starch uh, digestibility. And it's a, this manure here, for example, if I can recall correctly, uh, this was testing around three to 4% starch. So three to 4% starch in the manure, we can usually see it with our own eyes. Uh, when it gets less than three, it's a little bit harder to see. Uh, we want to ideally be three or two or one. And then that means that we're get, the getting, that we have very good uh, processing. So I want, do actually run into uh, these uh, farms uh, once in a while. Um, uh, of course, not they're, they're, uh, they're excellent farmers, but once in a while, the, uh, the corn harvest may get uh, a bit delayed and the uh, high moisture corn comes in a little bit too dry. Therefore, it's difficult to roll. And then we may get those high fecal starch uh, analysis. So yeah. fun topic, manure. Um, it's a hard thing to talk about at uh, parties uh, with your uh, non-farm friends. Uh, but, you know, when there's a bunch of dairy farmers around and nutritionists, this is the first thing we usually go to is what uh, fecal starch manure analysis look like on their clients or farms. So <laughs> um, third thing of the five things I want to review today is uh, straw. Okay. Now, I don't want to be too blatant here. Uh, like, like the uh, title of the slide says, cut it straw out. Um, I think there's, uh, we need to take a rational look at the use of straw though. Um, straw has been used for decades. Um, when I went to Western Canada for my schooling and to, uh, to work 25 years ago, uh, straw was commonly being chopped up with a flail chopper and uh, being put out for calf, heifer replacement calves, uh, beef cattle background and lots. Um, it was often being fine chopped and put into uh, different dairy TMRs. Uh, so it's been used for a very long time in the, uh, especially in the Western uh, states and provinces. Um, in, in the recent uh, two decades, we've seen it uh, become quite common in uh, Eastern Canada, and I'm sure Eastern U.S. as well. I'm not sure when uh, people in the Eastern U.S. start using straw, but in Eastern Canada especially, it's become extremely, extremely common to feed straw. Now, I like straw for many reasons. However, it's not usually price friendly to feed straw in many cases. And let me go through examples of when it may be warranted and when you may want to consider uh, alternatives to straw, okay? First of all, why do we use straw? Um, and if anybody would uh, like to put uh, their comments into the chat window, that would be great. Why do you guys, why do you use straw? Why, why would you put straw? Uh, my dad, would roll over in his grave if he knew we were feeding straw to these high performance Holsteins. Um, but we know there's reasons to feed it. I just want to know what you guys think about why, why do you feed straw? Adam says dry cow diets. Yep. They're really available to Duncan K. Uh, the structure, I assume, Walter, you mean like uh, the, uh, the structure of the fiber, right? Is that correct? Okay, yes, thank you. All right, so yeah, couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more. It's, um, it's, you know, we seem to all be using it for uh, one of two reasons, uh, to lower the energy density of that diet. Uh, and number two, to add some structural or what we call UNDF or effective NDF to that diet. There's two reasons for straw. Um, third reason may be just because it's so darn cheap. Uh, if you're from an area where it produces ample, uh, you know, where my wife's uh, family farm is from in Saskatchewan, uh, they used to burn straw in the windrows. I, I don't know. It, it probably has more value uh, in Saskatchewan now, but 
when I went to college, uh, these, they used to be fires uh, where they burnt straw in the field just to get rid of it. So um, nowadays in the parts of Canada that, that I work in, uh, straw can be worth anywhere from 150 uh, Canadian per metric ton to um, 300 in the same region, especially this time of year when straw availability is quite low. Um, and uh, I even see straw costing upwards of $500 per metric ton uh, when we travel to, uh, because we do nutrition on the island of uh, Newfoundland, where freight uh, often adds about two to $300 to a ton of straw. So, um, so to focus on uh, straw though and, and, uh, and diets, um, a lot of times the cat herd is a little butter fat. Uh, we're coming up to a heat stress season and, uh, and everybody knows that in late July, early August, especially uh, when we get those super hot, sticky days, uh, butter fat goes. Um, manures often get looser for many reasons. The intake's lower. Uh, cud chewing is uh, still there, but it's much lower. And um, that's, again, the importance of having an excellent ventilation system because you certainly don't see a lack of cud, a big drop in cud chewing when the ventilation systems are up to par. Um, but generally, straw is added in those situations. And then it's usually kept in there. Then it becomes clutter. It's there all year round. Uh, but really, what we should be focusing on is, unless straw is your cheapest source of effective fiber, uh, we should be looking at the, the structure of our grass and alfalfa silage and of our corn silage to make sure we're getting enough effective fiber from our cheaper sources of silage or forage in that diet, which in North America are typically grass alfalfa clover in some areas and corn silage. So uh, the easiest way to improve uh, the NDF, the effective NDF content of the diet or the UNDF is to, uh, to focus on some grass silage. If you're in an area that could grow grass silage uh, and focus on that stage of harvest, not being too young on first cut, but being at that right ADF so that you have enough uh, structural fiber. And you know the good thing about waiting for that structural fiber to be there on first cut is that you have a, uh, a lot more volume. Um, I never thought I'd hear myself say that you should intentionally hold off on first cut of harvest um, of grasses to, to, uh, to provide enough effective fiber, but I do hear myself saying that a lot. And I see farmers and uh, clients uh, doing that on a regular basis is to get that first cut at the right time, not too early. Uh, certainly not too late because then you certainly lose a lot of uh, NDF digestibility, especially at 30 hours. When you go from that, say 35 ADF up to 40, there's a drastic loss of digestibility, but we don't seem to see a big loss in digestibility as our ADF goes from 30 to, uh, to 34. So um, one thing that we've uh, experimented a lot with here on the uh, East coast, and I've also I've seen it everywhere as a matter of fact, is the use of uh, Goldilocks uh, haylage. So, what this Goldilocks haylage is, is a, uh, intentionally a field of uh, grass that's kept uh, growing until um, it becomes uh, essentially a, a seed head on that grass. So in reed canary, that would be the development of a seed head. You'd see actually the, the crop actually ripening in the field a bit and then going in there. Uh, in Canada, that's typically around Canada Day when you would take that off and that's going to result in a... Uh, an NDF of around 70% on mature grass and with much higher protein levels than uh, straw and uh, still has, um, uh, you know, it, it has got, it has a little bit uh, less uh, UNDF than straw, um, but it's, it's actually a, uh, a really good source of NDF. So um, this acts very good in a close-up diet. When you let grass mature like that, you usually get quite a dilution of potassium. And if we're on an anion diet, uh, that dilution of potassium uh, seems to work really well. This doesn't have to be silage. It can also be, be a gra mature grass hay. It doesn't have to be reed canary. It can be timothy. It can be festoleum. It can be tall fescue. Uh, generally, I like the thicker stalked uh, grasses, though, like um, the, uh, in, in this part of the world, reed canary grass and uh, uh, timothy. So corn stockage can also be used. Um, and you can see here where the NDF compares on these common high fiber Goldilocks diet type forages. Uh, wheat straw is clearly the highest and best source of NDF. Uh, and it's very, uh, very high in UNDF as well. So very undigestible. 
and it doesn't provide much protein. So what I like about the mature grass is that you get some protein, you get some energy from it, and it can be the predominant part of that diet. We've a lot of the diets that are using this mature grass, hey, are uh, are feeding about seventy to eighty percent of the forage as grass hay, grass or grass silage, this mature grass silage, and you can see it has plenty of structural fiber. Um, Heard one of you in the chat one of there say that structural fiber is super important to you and you're in choosing straw. Well, you know what? This reed canary provides almost looks like straw when you chop it in July. So uh, I'd love to hear your comments in the, in the uh, feedback window about this. Um, so Danielle says limited land base um, acres are put into other crops we need. We do not have extra acres for grass. Uh, again, this is a regional decision to, uh, to grow grass. So I can understand, uh, Danielle, in certain areas of Canada and US where land value is uh, hyper uh, valuable or hyper inflated. Um, why would you grow um, the field of reed canary that you cut in July, right? Wouldn't make sense. Certainly would make sense to continue feeding wheat, uh, wheat straw that's imported, say, from one or 200 kilometers or miles away. So, yeah. Um, So is there a case for straw? I think if the price is right in Daniel, Danielle's examples, yeah, it makes sense to feed straw. Um, but in a lot of cases, if you can grow a uh, provide, if you can grow on your own farm and you have enough land, uh, the right amount of effective fiber, it's, it's a, a, a good way to almost completely go away from straw with the exception of that uh, dry cow diet perhaps. So number four um, of the five things that uh, we can do to declutter a dairy diet, is uh, take a look at the additives or what we call the nice to haves. I think uh, Mike Hutchins probably, I think I stole this word from Mike Hutchins, the nice to haves, uh, but it's so, it's, it's applies so well, doesn't it? Um, now, it, there certainly are many times where additives are not only justified, but they're actually absolutely crucial uh, in the dairy diet, okay? Now, these are just some examples and every farm is individualistic here and, um, and should be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But often I think that a lot of people would agree that when additives are used, um, not all the time, but sometimes it's to address an, an underlying cow health issue. For example, uh, always, uh, you know, some vitamin E is one of the first additives we would uh, put into a diet. We try to get to that 2000 I use per cap per day as a close up dry cow and a lactating cow uh, because there's some data out there that shows that it combat, that it reduces uh, somatic cell count and new cases of mastitis. So I don't know if there's a lot of data, but we certainly remember that there is data. So that one of the first things we do in a high somatic cell situation is we add high vitamin E. Um, now, zinc, um, there's many forms of excellent zinc out there, uh, but it often would be recommended by a hoof trimmer to, uh, to combat say ulcers or something like that, or some other underlying foot issue. Um, whether or not it's, it's really helping or not, uh, is, is uh, questionable. It depends on what the problem is with that foot. Um, or if the repros brad on a farm, um, we're often asked by the vet or even the nutritionist may recommend, or the feed company represent may recommend the addition of a toxin binder. Now, these are all excellent ingredients uh, if, uh, if they're used in the right circumstances, okay? What I have seen around the world is the use of multiple forms of toxin binders. Um, I've seen uh, in some cases uh, zinc that is fed at two to 300% of requirement, um, still actually quite common. And I've seen vitamin E that stays in there year round at a high level. So we have a high E level for a uh, year round. And those are things that cost 10, 15, 20 cents a cow a day that we continue to have in that diet for an extended amount of time. Uh, so for every thousand cows you milk, um, it really multiplies out to a heavy, heavy investment. And in some case, sometimes uh, we have to question that. Right? Now, minerals, vitamins have been overfed for uh, uh, many, many years, for decades, as a matter of fact, uh, two to three fold. And that's because there may be some reason we may want to have enough in there just in case, right? Uh, just in case the water's bad, just in case there's some extra uh, micronutrient in that uh, forage or grain that we're buying and we want to have, we don't want to worry about antagonistic effects. Uh, we always have fed two to three fold. Uh, but you know what? That stuff costs an extra two to three cents per cow per day when we feed two to three fold. Two to three cents adds up every day on uh, every thousand cows you milk. 
Instead, as Dr. Bill Weiss would explain, um, don't really overfeed at all, I think is what Bill suggests. And there was a reason why recommendations are published and he likes to see uh, at the most, I, I don't wanna say, put words in his mouth, but I think at the most uh, 120% of requirement for many of the uh, micro minerals. Additives can add up. Um, I'm not sure if they use the word, if that's how the word additives came to be because it adds up, but you know what, it's, um, it's clear that when we feed uh, many of these, uh, you know, some of these are only five cents a cow a day, organic selenium, zinc, you know, it's only going to be an extra five cents roughly, depending on how much you feed and what type you feed. Uh, Rometin, biotin, those are all five, 10 cents a cow a day. Uh, but if you're feeding, say, two things, uh, that's 10 to 20 cents a cow a day. And you could be feeding some yeast, maybe some B vitamin packs. And there's, you know, certainly there's, there's research on this stuff that warrants its use. Um, however, if, uh, if money is a challenge then we have to be, uh, aware of what we're spending our, our feed dollars on and these things all add up, uh, some of these, uh, bottom additives like palmitic acid, different fat blends like calcium salts. Uh, we're seeing a lot of high oleic acid fats in the market now, uh, toxin binders, anionic salts, calcium binders, enzymes, uh, these things could be priced anywhere from 20, 30 cents up, to, uh, and in case of fats, upwards of a dollar a cow day. So they all add up. I mean, we have to certainly take a serious look at, at uh, cleaning up our diets if we're uh, concerned about profitability. Um, now, this is a, a simple slide that I'm sure uh, many of us already relate to, but I'll, I will uh, present it. It's titled Deciding When to Use Additives. And it's a... Uh, I, I always say number one is obviously this should be based on return on investment. And that may not be a return that you're going to get uh, tomorrow. Um, for example, when you feed palmitic acid uh, or, or a certain type of uh, bypass fat, uh, usually you're going to know within three, four days what your return on investment is because you're going to get a milk or a butterfat response. Uh, but not all additives are like that. When you feed vitamin E to combat high somatic cell count, it may take a whole lactation. And still, you won't have enough cows and, and you, you don't have a, a, a scientific um, experiment run on your farm where you can really say it was a high vitamin E that brought about high, lower somatic cell. Um, but what I'm saying is that when we, we should be looking at a lot of these additives as, um, as, a, as a possible solution uh, alongside looking at what we can do in our management uh, of the farm and how we can help, how we can help coach. If, if I'm speaking to advisors here today, how we can coach our clients through some management changes to improve things like somatic cell count, um, uh, low pregnancy rates, uh, and on and on and on. Um, the other uh, thing about uh, feeding addicts is that we should certainly if it's not science-based and if it's something very new in the market that doesn't have a lot of science, then at least we should have some good peer uh, or fellow farmer uh, support of, of what it does or anecdotal. Um, many times uh, good additives have science behind them, uh, but sometimes uh, it takes for the example of palmitic acid when it first came into North America uh, 13 years ago, uh, there was hardly any science on it. There's a couple of trials, uh, one out of Idaho, another a few out of uh, other parts of the world that showed the butterfat response. Um, but we were feeding it in the meantime, and we all knew that it gave butterfat response, but the science took uh, until people like Adam Locke uh, caught up on the science. Uh, soon after that, uh, it took a couple of years really for science to catch up with what we were already seeing in the field, right? So there's many examples of that out there. So here's some questions that you may want to ask your supplier if you're a dairy farmer listening today, or even if you're a feed industry person that's uh, speaking to a supplier of certain additives. What response should I expect or can I tell my clients to expect? What benchmark should I follow to determine if that response is happening? And a, a good uh, uh, feed ingredient supplier will say, well, you know, you got to watch pregnancy rate, you know, and you got to, you know, we can go on dairy comp and break down your pregnancy rates by, by uh, three week intervals. And this is what you want to watch, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that would be a good answer from a supplier in this case. Um, the other question asked is how long should this take for us to see a response? And of course, what is the cost? And also a really important question. This is a question that we probably don't ask enough of our additive suppliers, but what are the factors that may derail the response from that additive? Okay. Um, I think we just, 
we like to, uh, to know what the return on investment is, what the cost is and how long it takes. But um, a lot of times when this stuff doesn't work, uh, the way that we're, t- we're uh, that the sign says, or the way that we're told to, or the way that our peers told us it works, um, it's nice to know ahead of time uh, what could possibly go wrong, so that then we can control that uh, bit of variation. So uh, the fifth thing is, uh, and this is where I think I want to more or less conclude the uh, the formal part of the presentation is um, to look at your antagonism of feeds in your diet. Now, here's a really good example. Um, This is not probably as common now as it was, say, uh, for example, eight, 10 years ago when uh, we were still trying to uh, figure out uh, butterfat depressions. And when, especially when we weren't uh, breeding our cattle for as much butterfat like we are nowadays. Uh, So this would be a case where we had, where we'd have a low butterfat. And um, now in in this example, we may have been feeding corn to cellar grains, say at five pounds or 2.3 kgs a cow. And say if it had 10% fat in it, uh, which is mostly uh, uh, RUFA or PUFA, whatever you want to call it, unsaturated fatty acids, and, uh, and therefore provoking a, a butterfat uh, depression through the production of trans fatty acids. So one of the uh, things that we may have done in the early days of palmitic acid feeding is instead of controlling that uh, uh, RUFA or PUFA uh, uh, level in the diet by controlling the corn distiller grains or, or other fatty uh, things in the diet, uh, we may have just used a band-aid approach and palmitic acid. Um, and then uh, we know that palmitic acid doesn't necessarily work well if you have a butterfat depression. Uh, in, in some cases, we almost have to have a good butterfat before you can really see palmitic acid excel. Uh, but the other thing we may have done is add straw or a buffer to the ration uh, to improve rumen, rumen health because, well, lack of forage um, or uh, too much corn distiller grains or too much starch you know, or that combination of all three, um, it just leads to a butterfat depression. So instead of adding Band-Aid uh, additives or feeds, um, it's better to address that uh, underlying problem. The patio door, sliding patio door example is always what we should think of when we try to fix a correct uh, an issue on the dairy diet. And that is um, if the wheels of the patio door slider are sticky, or broke, that handle is going to break every time you try to shut that door. The problem is the wheels, it's not the handle. Uh, there's a couple of a final, a couple of final slides here. Um, I think many of you on a uh, presentation day, uh, I may be able to access my LinkedIn profile. And if, if you aren't on, if you, uh, aren't uh, linked up with me on LinkedIn, it would be, it'd be really cool to have you uh, join in because there's a, uh, there's a lot of good conversation. I usually put up a post uh, once or twice a week on nutrition or management. And this is one that I posted three months ago, got a lot of really good feedback. And um, this, it's a good continuation of the talk that we're giving today is the, the topic was solutions to maintain milk yield, but reduce diet costs. And I simply presented three things that I thought were really important. And that was uh, focusing on the details of minerals, not overfeeding, doing frequent feed analysis that only costs $30, but it only takes a nutritionist five or 10 minutes to correct. Um, focusing on MUN uh, for when we're, when we're balanced in diets and uh, during expensive protein times, uh, we often get into uh, trying to buy some of the cheaper sources of protein. And inevitably, the cheap ones are the ones that are high in degradable protein. And the problem with uh, degradable protein is that we're not going to meet our MP requirements unless we feed some really uh, high bypass sources, obviously. And I, I spoke about the importance of monitoring MUN, mercury and nitrogen at that time. Uh, but I also talked about just the fact that uh, it may be worth actually replacing some of your high degradable protein sources, maybe with just one additional high MP source, say a uh, heat treated soy or something like that. Um, Anyways, you can go through that if you'd like. Uh, we had one, you know, one person I respect a lot in our, in our dairy industry is uh, David Green. Um, he's a great guy. He's uh, he often posts some really intelligent stuff and in some of the uh, some of our, the LinkedIn uh, uh, material I put out there. And and this is what Dave had to say about this. A lot of things mentioned here are important, but most of all, get the feed mixed correctly. Deliver the proper amount at the right time and keep it pushed up to the cows every hour to hour and a half. 
if we don't do these things, it doesn't matter how the diet is formulated. Just because cows have feed in the bunk doesn't mean it's correctly mixed or fed at the proper time to help efficiency in production. I often see this as one of the biggest challenges, even on the best of farms. So um, I'll close it with this slide here. Um, this is a, uh, a summary, I guess. The benefits of decluttering your dairy diet are, are number one, uh, you spend less time on uh, negotiations. And uh, number two, you spent the farm or your customer can spend less time on ordering and inventory management. And number three, when you have less ingredients, clearly we're going to have less shrink. So these are some of the basics of just advantages of decluttering a dairy diet. You know, and what I mean by decluttering is maybe, maybe it's not a big step that you want to do, but instead of using, say, five proteins on your farm, maybe go down to three or four. Instead of using two forms of starch, maybe consider going to one if the price or if, you, if the reasons are right. Um, and the final thing is to, at times like this, when everything costs a lot, instead of trying to make your diet 95% perfect or 99% perfect, uh, why not consider making it 90% right and focusing on all the other things, for example, uh, such as what David Green just mentioned um, and all the things that were mentioned in the chat window today about things that you have control over. Management, 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 um, utter preparation for milk and feeds and medication, being consistent with every chore. Those are all the things that we have control over as dairy farmers or advisors to, uh, to dairy people. So that's what we should be focused on instead of having 90% of the, uh, instead of being trying to be 99.99% perfect. Can never reach perfection, right? Um, and uh, as a final uh, slide here, the, um, uh, there's one more post that uh, is very similar to the topic here. I put this up around a month ago. It got a lot of really good feedback, and that's the reason why I'm uh, putting it up here to show today. But the topic was 40 simple ways to tweak, tweak uh, dairy profitability. Now, I think there's over 10,000 people that read this, and it was not uh, because of this uh, this uh, heavy science-based information that I put up here. It's because there was a lot of good comments and there's probably uh, 50 to 60 other tips provided by people on that same post. And it's really good reading, really good things to share with your uh, clients too, if you're an advisor. So I think that's a good place to turn it over to uh, Karen. All right, thank you very much. This was great. You had a lot of feedback through the chat and that's really exciting. So thank you to everybody who participated. We do have a couple questions, but I'm just going to preface it with we're not going to get to all of the questions that we have today. So if you do have a question and we don't answer it, we will ask Daniel to follow up with you after the fact. So the first thing uh, is that one of the people in the chat has asked for any information you have with regards to probiotics. Uh, probiotics. Um, so, yeah, I saw that question. So I you now I'll, I'll be the first conf to confess. Uh, I am not a probiotic expert. So I think I'm gonna defer this question, okay? Okay, that works well. Uh, Walter is wondering what you think about automatic feeding systems. Uh, Walter, I saw that question in the uh, QA window. Thank you for uh, bringing this up. Uh, when you mean uh, automatic feed systems, I'm just gonna ask you one question back here. Do you mean actually uh, automatic feed systems for the dairy herd? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean because the other automatic feeding system that we refer to in our industry is the, uh, the automatic calf feeding system? So um, I believe you're probably talking about the, uh, the dairy. Um, let's see what comes up in the chat here. He says, yes. Dairy, dairy cows. cows. Okay, Walter. Uh, so, so Walter, um, uh, here's the benefits of an automatic feeding system. Uh, it's mechanized. Uh, it can control labor to a certain uh, extent. And uh, actually one of uh, my nutrition associates, uh, Amber Craswell, who I'm not sure if you're on the talk today or not, Amber, uh, but she actually, uh, they have a beautiful uh, two robot de Lavelle uh, farm in uh, near Cavendish PEI. And they operate a de Lavelle automatic feed system. And um, I've also seen uh, other brands. And I'll tell you the benefit of these automatic feed systems is frequency of feeding, okay? I always used to be a big fan of feeding once a day and feed a massive mountain of feed in front of those cows and then frequently push it up. Uh, but that's before I started to look at Trevor DeVries' data and, and some other data out of UBC going back as far as 10 years ago when it's actually uh, the feed out that actually will provoke a cow to get up and eat, not just feed push-ups. So there's many ways to provoke high dry matter intake 
And that's one of the beauties of these automatic feed systems is that we can go out there easily and cheaply uh, seven, eight uh, times a day and deliver fresh feed. Uh, the one thing I don't, the, or the one thing that uh, is a little bit that we have to take precaution in is that we never let that feed bunk go empty. If we're trying to feed small amounts seven or eight times a day, and this applies to the same as a lot of my friends in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and I think some of you are on this call today, um, yeah, often and also in uh, Vietnam, uh, we often feed small amounts frequently, and that's to avoid heating. Uh, we do, that's the reason why we do it that way in the KSA and uh, in the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia is because we're trying to prevent feed, uh, feed bunk heating, and it makes sense to feed frequently. Uh, with the automatic feed system and with the uh, that model of uh, feeding in uh, the uh, in the, the hotter tropical environments, um, we have to be careful. They never run out of feed. Uh, ideally, we want that cow milking for 24 hours minus the standing time and milking time. Uh, there's three things we want a cow doing: uh, lying down, uh, milking or waiting to be milked, and hopefully that's minimized. If you're in a parlor situation, and that's the benefit of the robot. And the, uh, the third thing is eating, so. All right, and if you're interested in learning more about uh, Trevor DeVries' thoughts around optimizing feed intake, we did do a webinar with him earlier this year, and you can find that on our YouTube channel. So the next question that we have is, what is the ratio between forage and concentrate on the farm that you presented? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, uh, I think it's close to uh, 50. It's, you know what, it's easier to just go back to the slide, right? Uh, so we have nine plus six is 15 kgs dry matter of forage over 30. So it's exactly 50%. And I believe the starch level in that corn silage is uh, not extremely high. It's around uh, 25 to 30% range. So that corn silage is uh, roughly um, one third grain, two thirds forage, if that helps answer your question. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up question in that regard? Yeah. I'm just going to give it a second to see if they actually okay. do. All right. So one of the questions that came in through the registration is what is the ideal ratio of feed to milk and how do you measure the concentrate to milk conversion ratio? Okay. Sorry. It, it, my, for some reason, my earbuds are crackling there. Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. What is the ideal ratio of feed to milk and how to measure concentrate to milk conversion ratio? Yeah. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, there's, and there's a number here on this, uh, this example farm uh, that I'll, I'll draw your attention to, and that's uh, specifically feed efficiency ratio. Um, I realize that in many parts of, uh, say, uh, in the United States, you look at uh, uh, different ratios. Uh, um, but the, the number that, that I like to look at is a feed efficiency ratio. And uh, you can go back and uh, if you guys uh, search uh, my name and feed efficiency ratio on Google or something like that, you're going to see presentations on YouTube and various other places on feed efficiency ratio. If you want to watch uh, uh, more information around that, uh, but I tend to like uh, feed efficiency ratio, and that's simply the uh, the milk fat corrected milk divided by kgs of dry matter intake um, on this farm here. Uh, fat corrected milk, I corrected 3.5% fat, which I know is really uh, old school. 3.5 is not that common anymore, especially if you're in a uh, butter fat market. Um, it should be correct in a four. But anyways, if you take 3.5, it's they end up, uh, it ends up being a 40, sorry, a 51 kg herd, 51 kgs of milk yield at 3.5 fat divided by uh, 29.5 kgs of DMI equals 1.75. Uh, so I like to talk in terms of FER, what I consider a really good FER is this uh, number between 1.65 and 1.9. And by the way, that number in, has gone up over the past few years. I see cows being more efficient. Um, that feed efficiency now in many of these farms is 1.7 to 1.8, whereas seven or eight years ago, when I really started to look at this number, uh, feed efficiency ratio used to only be around 1.6 to 1.65 on the really good herds. Now it's 1.7, 1.8, sometimes 1.9. And if we're two, that's just too high, by the way. We have to be careful that we're not burning too much fat off that cow's back. So feed efficiency ratio. Perfect. And I'm actually going to end us there. We're a little over time. So if we haven't answered your questions, what we'll do is we'll get back to you via email. 
And Daniel, if I can get a copy of your presentation, that will be available for anyone who's interested in it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think everybody uh, has my email. Uh, it's just on that uh, um, so this slide here, danielscothernutrition.com. And the, uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you can just message me anything that you want to discuss. And uh, the other thing is I just want to uh, thank uh, VES and Artec. Um, Artec was always a company that uh, I, uh, I took note of when I was younger. Um, if, if you guys have done a lot of nice products and you've done a lot to the uh, in VES as well. You've done, you guys have done a lot to improve the well-being of cattle and of dairy men and women in our country. So I think it's, uh, it's should be recognized how, uh, how much impact you've had on cow well-being. So thank you very much. We enjoy hearing that. So we want to say thank you for coming out. This has been a great presentation and uh, we hope that we'll have an opportunity to speak with you again. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.